Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Chris Allen, Chris Smith, Mark Gibson, and everybody welcome our brand new patron, Amy Russ. Yay. Welcome, Amy. Hey, welcome, hey, Amy. Thanks, Amy. On this episode of DTNS, Andrew Main explains why AI might lead to 0% unemployment. Plus, Scarlett Johansson's beef with OpenAI and Sonos finally releases those headphones. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, May 21st, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, founder of Interdimensional, former OpenAI science communicator and author of Dark Dive, a thriller, Andrew Bain. Welcome back. Man, I picked the perfect day to come on DTNS. <laughs> Why do you say that, no. Andrew? Oh, you know, when you're uh, your I can't employer, even imagine how you. the news would be applicable <laughs> to your yeah. I would say it's possible you picked a good day to no to be the former communicator. Oh perhaps. no, I, I would I I would be very happy to be there right now with everybody there. I, You'd be in the but, trenches, yeah. Oh my sure. it's an amazing group of people and, and uh don't go into that, but yeah, no, I would yeah, yeah, I yeah. feel guilty <laughs> that I'm not. I see, I see, I see. Well, let's take your mind off it with some quick hits. Microsoft introduced Team Copilot for Microsoft Teams. It can manage meeting agendas, take notes, summarize info, and answer questions about what has been discussed in a Teams meeting. It can also work with Microsoft's Loop and Planner plat planning platforms and can create and assign tasks, track deadlines, ask for team input, all that stuff. Team Copilot is coming in preview later this year for customers with a Copilot for Microsoft 365 license. The EU Council has approved the EU AI Act, which we've talked about before on this show, but this is the last step before it gets published. Once it gets published in the EU official journal, 20 days later, it becomes law. So there's no more like if it gets approved, it's approved. Uh, it's going to be law within the month. The Act bans behavioral manipulation and things like social scoring out outright, uh, but it rates everything else on a risk scale. So it strictly regulates what it considers high risk things like biometrics and facial recognition, though it doesn't outright ban those. AI app developers will have to register their systems and meet risk and quality management obligations. But chatbots, like ChatGPT, for example, are considered lighter risk and have fewer obligations. Meanwhile, the second AI summit held in Seoul, South Korea, issued the Seoul Declaration to pursue safety, inclusiveness, innovation, and interoperation in AI uses. The session was attended by representatives from the G7 countries, as well as Tesla's Elon Musk, Samsung's chairman Lee Jae-yong, and representatives from OpenAI, Google, Microsoft, Meta, and Korea's Naver. Volvo and autonomous driving company Aurora announced their first production-ready self-driving truck based on Volvo's Class 8 semi-truck, the VNL. It runs on Aurora's Level 4 autonomous system, which allows the truck to operate without a human driver. The trucks will be built into Volvo's Dublin, Virginia plant, and Aurora plans to deploy 10 of those trucks this year, so slow rollout, expanding to 100 in 2025 iOS and iPadOS 17.5.1 are out and contain a fix for that bug we talked about that caused some users to see deleted photos reappear in their library unexpectedly. Uh, the bug fix notes that the photos reappeared because of, quote, database corruption. Ars Technica explains that it appears they were moved to a 30-day grace period section in case of the need to undelete, and because of the database corruption, never actually left that after 30 days. I love the database corruption. You know? We need to fight me, corruption just, in the database. No us. more database it, bribes. Yeah. The database me, went crazy. It would just be a bunch of photos I sent to my doctor going, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It could be something you don't want around anymore. That's for sure. Yeah. Google has begun including a sponsored section under its AI overview results that summarize answers to a search query. The company says it will display ads in AI overview when they're relevant to both the query and the information in the AI overview. Advertisers who play ads in search already will be automatically eligible to appear in AI overviews as well. Yeah, so there you go. That's one of the ways they're going to try to make money off it. Nothing scary. 
Yesterday, we learned that OpenAI had pulled its Sky voice from use with text-to-speech in GPT-40, and OpenAI explained that the voice was trained off of the work of a paid actress. It was not intended to sound like Scarlett Johansson, although many people remarked that the Sky voice, which was used in OpenAI's demo last week, sounded a lot like the AI voice from the movie Her, which was performed by Johansson. After we did DTNS, or actually po possibly during DTNS, uh, Scarlett Johansson issued a statement. Among the things she said were that she had been offered and even considered licensing her voice to OpenAI, but declined the company's request to license her voice last September for personal reasons. Two days before the demo, uh, CEO Sam Altman apparently contacted Johansson's agent asking if she would reconsider, but the demo happened before they could respond. Uh, now, in Scarlett Johansson's own words, she wrote, When I heard the released demo, I was shocked, angered, and in disbelief that Mr. Altman would pursue a voice that sounded so eerily similar to mine that my closest friends and news outlets could not tell the difference. Johansson's legal counsel has contacted OpenAI and asked them to detail the process by which they created the Sky Voice. So that they didn't threaten to take them to court directly. They said, we need you to tell us how this was done. Then we'll threaten to take you to court. Uh, Johansson wrote, I look forward to resolution in the form of transparency and the passage of appropriate legislation to help ensure that individual rights are protected. Uh, Sam Altman said, we cast the voice actor behind Sky's voice before any outreach to Ms. Johansson. Out of respect for Ms. Johansson, we have paused using Sky's voice in our products, and we are sorry to Ms. Johansson that we didn't communicate better. Uh, Johansson, uh, definitely not happy with this, but... They could be taking a stronger tactic here. Uh, looks like OpenAI is trying to act accommodating. Uh, you know, you, you're not there anymore, Andrew, but what's your take on this? Yeah, I'm, I'm speaking as citizen Andrew. And so um, I I was, you know, I've been OpenAI when to develop voice. I've used the voice technologies, the cloning technologies and stuff. By the way, that's something OpenAI sat on for almost two years because they were considerate about the potential risks for that and did not want to you know, put something out there. They think about these things very much so. Um, I had heard the Sky voice, and I have met, I may be the only open eye person to ever met Scarlett Johansson in person. I never connected the two voices. I never connected them. Certainly there's an emotive thing that's unlike Siri and other things, but I, listening to voice, I never thought, oh, that sounds like oh, her. So, so the Sky voice you were familiar with and just yeah, I've heard, never yeah, thought, yeah, I, like, I, I, oh, I, they're obviously replicating that movie her. No, I, I they, they're you know in in any in AI you look for great examples of stuff. You have the cool calculating how, and then you look for things that are more positive emotive voices. And so they have a number of voices that they use and they released. And so it's my t I, I never connected those two because just one I the I I've tried to say this in a polite way. Sky voice sounds more like I kind of like expect like a one nine hundred number to sound like, and so it's just you know, but. Uh, you know, that again, that's my take on it. And I know that the problem is, is that I think the, the their timing is was just looks bad optically because, you know, you've had with GPS navigation systems, they've reached out to have people do voices for that. That's a common thing. And I think that people are conflating two things, them reaching out to ask a celebrity, hey, can we use your voice? And also another female voice, it's emotive. And I've asked people to actually listen to the two voices together. And to me, it sounds completely different, but, you know. I mean, it, it, it seems to me like uh, there's a few things going on here. First of all, just because Scarlett Johansson's voice was the voice in the movie Her, which was a bit before our, you know, AI time that we're in now, um, but, you know, but, but was a futuristic movie, that's always going to, you know, people are going to make that comparison if they've seen the movie and, you know, be, you know care about sci-fi in general. But the fact that the company specifically asked Scarlett Johansson, hey, do you want to be a part of this? And she went, mm, I don't. And then went back to her and said, second chance. And she <laughs> said, still don't want to do it. And then it's like, oh, now that's my voice. I can see where that's where it gets weird. It's not so much that like, 
oh, how strange that, you know, this voice yeah, but it's not so her much voice, like though. you. I, mean, I, I, think, I think that's, well, there are people that are voice, saying that it's... was cloned and stuff. And there was a misconception. Some people like, and it's like, no, like literally there is a woman who's that is her voice, a real person who did that long before this took place. And then people are conflating them to go, that's in a, so I would say that's the big difference I would, you know, call out. I, I, yeah. And, and hundred um, percent. I just think the fact that open AI went to Johansson specifically more than once to say, we would like you to be part of this. And she said, no, thank you. Um, that's where this all gets weird. Yeah, I, I look at it and I, I think it's reasonable. In fact, Sam Altman even wrote her on X to say like, hey, that Sky demo really felt like her. In other words, it was an AI voice, but it had emotion and it was laughing and it was approachable. Some people thought it was even flirty. Uh, I get the connection there. Whether there's a legal connection, in other words, did it sound kind of like the character from her or did it sound like Scarlett Johansson's performance from her? Uh, that's that's where this would get interesting if it went to court because it's not a copyright infringement because they did not use Scarlett Johansson's voice and nobody's contending they did. It's a likeness right. You have a right to say, no one can hire an imitator to imitate me and imply that it was me doing it. I can't hire a Christopher Walken impersonator to do my ad and make people think maybe Christopher Walken did my ad. Uh, and a court would have to decide, is that what OpenAI was up to here? Uh, if this were to go to court, it doesn't look like it's going to court. It looks like OpenAI is very being very accommodating and saying, you know, we don't want to offend. We want to navigate this properly and we want to respect people's rights. Yeah, um, I mean, I, yeah, sorry, Sarah, go ahead. No, no, no please. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I think, again, it, it's it's one of these things, I think the timing of the situation, the way things have sort of come out, it's it's a, uh, it is a very sensitive issue because, you know, the whole writer's strike and everything, actors in yeah. Hollywood are very, very concerned yeah, about that. there's a lot and of that going it, on. yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it was significant that uh, Scarlett Johansson's note said that she wanted legislation. Uh, so it seemed like more of an appeal to some kind of uh, political push that she might be getting behind rather than specifically, I'm going to sue you, OpenAI. And that, that's where it's going to get tricky. And and by the way, remember the, the controversy last week was the Apple ad crushing all the musical yeah. instruments. So clearly there is a sensitivity out there that tech needs to be aware of that things that may seem like they're not a big deal is triggering for people. Um, I would be curious, like legislation, is it like, does that mean that you can block anybody that sounds like you, you know, because that gets to be in a very weird situation because the issue at hand is it's not that somebody's voice was copied. It was that somebody feels, well, this person sounds like me. And so Too should that like actress me, yeah. who has I that mean, voice if, not be allowed if, to work? If the Sky voice sounded like me... And I thought so. And we could only be so lucky. Sarah. You, right. You know, and, and everyone was sort of like, wow, it almost sounds like you, Sarah. And it just was sort of rando. I go, isn't that funny? If the company had pinged me a couple of times before, mm. you know, a p very public demo being like, would you like to be part of this? And I say, no, thanks. That's where it gets weird. So again. let me, let me ask a question here though. Is it, the thing that I think, because like again, I hear it sounds I, like I said as a guy that had spoken to Mr. Johansson before and watched development, who was never, who's always ready to make the connections, never to collect this. The thing I was aware of though was it was the first time people have ever seen an AI voice that was that emotive, and mm -hmm. I wondered if that was the factor. Was it we're used to the neutral flat Siri, the telephone operator, all this. This was the first time in AI, and by the way, that voice technology is insane. I don't know if you've watched the other demos where it's able to mimic sounding like a robot, slow down its pace, speed up. I was wondering if like, well, if it's kind of like the closest example we've ever had of an AI that can have that range of emotion was in the movie. You know, is that yeah. part of why people, because yeah. again, if you listen to them side by side, they sound like very different people to me. I'm obviously very biased. But I think that it might be just the inflections, the ability to have that. And also, when you showcase something, you kind of dial it up, you amp it up, the emotion and all these other things. So is it a matter of it just being that good at emotion? That people is it the, the first voice that sounded like the voice from the character in her and therefore it's being identified? Or is it imitating the character for her that again that that would be for a court to decide i suppose well and that's that probably you know that's going to be a big conversation we have going forward is 
We have different voices. Do you want a man? Do you want a woman? Do you want an mm -hmm. Australian accent? And, you know, like there are like some, you know, we, we have some options, but that whole sort of like, yeah. Do you want um, an assistant who's peppy, an assistant who's sort of mean to you? I mean, there's all sorts of ways that, you know, this is going to get more complicated going forward. And, and there's yeah, a thing too. Sure. Which is, you know, some I've had to cast people for audio books and et cetera and for commercials and that. There's a difference between a voice that you want to listen to for 30 seconds or 10 minutes that sounds really cool and engaging and a voice that you want to listen to all day or for maybe the rest of your life. And I think that's that are, that's things that people in AI have to think about now is it's not just you're not casting a character for a movie. You are going to be casting somebody that is going to be a friend or AI companion, which means how you dial up what you do might be affected over the longer term. You know, what, what's your patience for that? Well, uh, no matter who you might be listening to, uh, <laughs> you might be in the market for new headphones. And if so, Sonos announced its first over the ear headphones, the Sonos Ace. These have been rumored since the first of the year and were, you know, uh, somewhat on the back burner. They are a real thing now. Noise canceling headphones, supporting spatial audio, also head tracking. Ear cushions are magnetic. They're also removable and color coded, so you know which goes on which side. USB C and headphone cables come in a bundle with the headphones that also attaches to the carrying case with a magnet. So this is designed to be sort of on the go with you as you travel around the world. Uh, <laughs> controls all physical. You need to use Sonos's somewhat unpopular new app to get EQ and change settings, but you know, the app works. You can also connect by cord, Bluetooth, or get music from the Sonos Arc speaker over Wi-Fi. Th that part was very interesting to me um, as, a, um, as a Sonos uh, a, a living room uh, theater user myself. More Sonos speakers uh, are apparently going to be supported soon. Uh, Sonos claims a 30 hour battery life. If you're not connecting to home theater audio, obviously it's gonna be a little bit less if you do. And if you're saying, this all sounds great, how much? Pre-orders open now, $450, shipping at June 5th. The question I have is, if you are not in the Sonos system, would you buy these headphones? Never. I see lots of reasons to buy them if you're in the Sonos system, but yeah. but four hundred fifty dollars is certainly not cheap. It's not the most expensive, but it's you know it's 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 not a bargain. It, uh, it's a high end Bose price. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, and and listen, I I've got let's see one two three four five Sonos speakers in my house right now. So they're um, for you. I, yeah. So, yeah. So, I, and I use them mostly as smart speakers, I'm not mm -hmm. even really, you know, to like play music and, and use them for, you know, their, their, their great EQ quality. But, um, I like Sonos. I also think Sonos is kind of a weird brand. Um, it's a high end brand. It is quirky, um, does things strangely. I thought Apple would acquire Sonos years ago. Never has happened. I still think it might, but um, I, and I don't really like over the ear headphones besides, you know, wearing my monitor speakers when I'm doing the show or any show here in my office. Um, I'm more just an ear earbud person, but the, the specs are very nice. These are, these are the highest end, you know, AirPods max quality over the ear headphones that, you know, that you're going to get out there. Um, I, I agree with you, Tom. Uh, if you don't have Sonos integrated into your life in any other way, why would you get these? I don't know. I mean, maybe it's your first foray into getting Sonos things, but Sonos works best as a, you know, um, a, like a daisy chain situation, you know, almost like, you know, a bunch of, I don't know, like a, a mesh Wi Fi network. Same idea. If you just have one or like even two Sonos products, not not hit in the same way. I don't know, Andrew. What do you think? I am. I, I have an Apple network with just you know the speakers and a HomePod downstairs, so I'm not terribly sophisticated when it comes to these things. I just want to plug it in and connect it to something I already use. So, uh, 
cool if you're a Sonos user. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my audio, exp I have my AirPods in like 24 seven. I have two different pairs here. So that's really, you know, my life for me. So this almost reminds me a little bit of when Tidal, uh, Tidal, the uh, streaming music service, um, announced you know, the, it was whatever, you know, the best audio quality ever that, you know, uh, Apple and Spotify don't give you, you know, and oh, people, like Neil Diamond too, remember? And a few, a few people were like, cool. And the rest of us were like, eh, Well, yeah, that was the going back to the MP3 debates years ago about what humans could actually detect mm -hmm. and whatnot. And, and like, you know, Apple now pushes the higher end stuff. They have the whole classical music streaming and, and things like I, I, I used to years ago, I worked with James Randi, who had this million dollar challenge for like paranormal unusual claims. And one of the things we'd test were these tube amplifiers that people would connect our, our special cables to make your hi-fi equipment sound better. You know, people would pay for thousands of dollars and we'd show they just could not tell the difference between them. And I certainly think there is a quality difference, by the way. I do think that some people for certain high ranges can pick that up. I don't want to dismiss that. But you do, you, I knew a billionaire that bought some high end audio equipment company because there is a category of, co of consumer that will keep paying more and more and more. And it's like the old Steve Martin joke about buying the Moon Rock record needle. I don't know if you remember this. And it's just, uh, and I, I think, you know, Sonus has certainly got a great reputation and, you know, addresses that. But that is just, beyond my understanding. I will say if you have a Sonos Arc, which is a um, the highest end Sonos soundbar um, that the company offers right now, what's nice about uh, about uh, the uh, the Sonos Ace, these headphones is it is a supposedly seamless way to, let's say, uh, you know, you know, my, my dog is, uh, sleeping comfortably next to me and I don't want to wake him by, you know, turning on a big old loud movie. Um, there, you know, there's some Bluetooth capability. You can do that with other headphones, uh, that this is certainly not anything that's reinventing the wheel, but to have the spatial audio, the Dolby, um, um, Atmos. <clears throat> Yeah. Yes, uh, capability no, that, as well. That I mean, that you know, the, again, for four hundred fifty dollars, that's what you would expect. But these are nice headphones. And I, you know, look, you're, you showed that sound bar, like a nine hundred dollar sound bar, is not a crazy thing. Like I, I spend about twenty minutes every night trying to get my AirPods to connect to my damn Apple TV because they just don't want to. Like they'll they'll be listening, they'll get a YouTube video, and they'll stop. And so I, you may convert me here, Sarah, just saying that if, that if I can get a seamless audio experiment and not be pulling these things in and out yep. to get that, uh, could be worthwhile. And, and they're not like Wi-Fi connection easier. Yeah. yeah easier Sonos name. doesn't sound like they're like in the anyway. crazy end of that space. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of Apple, um, there is a little company called Apple, Cupertino, California. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, if so, Eileen Rivera and I host a little show about that very little company called Apple Vision Show every week to talk about whether Apple's vision matches what we, the consumers, want. We had a really fun conversation uh, uh, with Scott Johnson on our latest episode. Uh, he joined us, and uh, it, it was great. So uh, get subscribed now. Join us, applevisionshow.com. Andrew recently wrote a piece published on reason.com called In the AI Economy, There Will Be 0% Unemployment. Now, if AI can already do so many of the things that our jobs do better than we can, and it's continually getting better, Andrew, how can you possibly make this argument? Zero percent. It's going to take all our jobs. What is going uh, on here? So also it's on the print. It's in the print edition, too, if you want to check that out. Uh, I am sure when people looked at mechanical plows, when 95 percent of the population was involved, not just in agriculture, but working at farms, working on farms, may have looked at that and said, well, shucks, what are we going to do now? Because our job is, you know, to plow fields. And now we've got these machines doing them. Uh, the history of humanity and the innovation, uh, you know, pre-enlightenment and through Fawn Ford has been one innovation after another. And the result has been that uh, 
having to employ fewer children, I'll point that out. I would say that the uh, unemployment, the employment rate for children has gotten worse. Now, 17 year old kids don't even have jobs. 12 year old kids are like going to school instead of working in coal mines. So it has had that negative impact. But <laughs> when you consider the percentage of the population that's actually engaged in employment, you have more people, more sectors of humanity are now engaged in higher skilled, more productive occupations. This is because of technology. Technology is an amplifier. You know, I can have a person with, you know, uh, a hoe go out there and have them try to, you know, till a field, put him in a tractor. All of a sudden, instead of just feeding himself and maybe some of his family members, the ones he likes, he can now feed the town. And if you can feed the town, then people move from working on farms to become carpenters to build buildings. They build roads. They build these things. And we build up the world. The world we live in today occurred because we used machines and we used technologies to replace or amplify human labor. Why would that stop? That's been my question to some of the people in AI who are, you know, people are commenters saying, well, you know, it's going to, we're going to, the AI is going to take all our jobs. Like that's never been the case. We've had technology displace and change, but my thesis comes down to this. If you assume that AI is going to keep getting more and more powerful, which means more efficient, able to do more work, and robotics is going to get better, we assume that this is going to continue. Also, what comes with that is economic growth. And economic growth could come from a company like H&R Block using AI and firing everybody and then making a tremendous amount of profit. And they could put it into a vault like Scrooge McDuck and swim through it. Uh, they could set it on fire. That would be their choice. But assuming they're going to act in their own selfish interest, they're going to try to make more money, which the way companies do that now, you know, you take Apple, which has hundreds of billions in cash, you reinvest it, you lend it, you allow other businesses to be created, you circulate that wealth so you can generate more wealth. And by doing that, you create more companies, you create more businesses, you create more products, all these things. So my, my thesis, which is not a radical one, is that as you have this economic growth, you're going to have a greater demand for labor because of it. And there will never be enough robots or AI or people to satisfy that demand. As the economy grows and you're going to need more of everything, that's going to include people. And so I think that we're going to have radical unemployment. In other words, ra ra radical employment. In other words, people will only choose not to yeah. work. They will. Very they will all have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I when when I talk about this with people, um, I I hear a lot like, yeah, I know with the industrial revolution it worked that way. With the computer revolution, it seems to have worked that way. But this time it will be different. And the argument seems to run along the lines of, uh, in the past. You know, computers cause the ability to take the tedium off of work and allow those workers to open up and become new kinds of workers that we couldn't afford to have before and created more productive jobs and increased wealth for everybody. But this time, the AI will take those jobs faster than we can create them. Why, why are you right that we, will, that we will not be able to meet the demand for labor with robots and AI uh, versus the people who are like, no, no, it'll get so good that it'll outpace our abilities? Well, it, it will outpace her. I mean, that's my really AI will get better and smarter than us, but there's just not going to be enough. And we've seen this right now. So but why? Why would why wouldn't there be enough? So we because there's not enough now and there's even less now. So a year ago, OpenAI releases ChatGPT, right? Low key research preview. By the way, I was in the room when we uh, were discussing this thing we didn't think was going to, you know, be have a big impact. The low key Boy, preview of ChatGPT. Low yeah, key turned research out to, preview. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that was hysterical. Uh, and we're trying to be the, we're the ones going, hey, the future's happening fast. Uh, so what happened? All of a sudden, it turns out that it wasn't 10,000 or 100,000 people that wanted to use this. It was millions, 100 million people a week are using ChatGPT. Problem is, there is not enough compute on the planet to meet that demand. That's why if you send too many requests in the span of a few hours, you get, hey, we got to put you over the dumber model right now because there isn't enough compute to do that. As other companies have been offering services, Google, Microsoft, Anthropic, et cetera, there is this compute crunch. There's not enough compute, okay? More people are trying to build centers and trying to do this. 
And when you look at the plans for building out compute, you realize we are way behind in being able to meet the present demand, the demand that's going to be in 12 months. And if you think that demand is going to level off, I have a very different opinion about this because I use every I have I was the first person, by the way, to ever have a subscription to ChatGPT. Um, I subscribe to everything because when I run out of you know my tokens or my limit on one, I switch to another. I think I'm going to be like a lot of people, and so there is not enough compute right now for orgs that want to use these systems. There is no sign that we're ever going to meet that demand because the more you use it, the more you do. I have spent hundreds of dollars per day paying for API usage in my code editor because it makes me that much more efficient. So we're at this point where we don't have enough compute now. And as we build out compute, the demand's only going to increase more. And and there's the the amount of compute we're building is already straining power supplies yep. uh, to, to where some countries are limiting data center builds and data centers are looking for places with cheaper power or more available power. So there's another limit there too. And- and the thing to think about is when it comes to like robotics, you, you, we, we, again, the problem is, is we're very, very bad at exponential thinking. And we also tend to think one-to-one -one replacement. And, you know, if you look, look around your house and said, hey, if you had a handyman that could work for five bucks an hour and could fix things, you would fix a lot of things. OK, if you look around your community, if you look at schools around the world, you know, we could be in a world where the average child in the global south could be going to school on a campus nicer than Stanford. That is a reality with robotics. That is a reality with an AI future where you drive down the cost of these things so low. And I think that people often don't think about that. They just think about like, well, I'm just going to replace the person at McDonald's with this. Well, well, yes, and you're going to have other services and stuff we didn't imagine. And an example I used is if I showed the first photograph to somebody in 1837, uh, which was the first photograph of a person taken accidentally when a camera was aimed at a street and left open for a long exposure, they might be worried about the artist. Like, what's going to happen to the portrait artist? You know, here's this thing, this machine, this camera that can now replicate what an artist can do. Well, it turned out that, you know, art is a something that an average person would pay to put in their home didn't even exist in. Now it is actually a much bigger commercial industry than ever has been. But if I tried to explain them, not only would that be a reality, but in the next century, you would have somebody like a director like James Cameron directing an army of people equal to one third the size of the United States standing army at that time with a budget equal to the entire United States military budget in 1837. And with a box office gross greater than what the GNP was going to be at that point, that would seem I'd seem like a crazy person, let yeah. alone trying to explain the blue people and everything else in Avatar. <laughs> but that's the reality. And if we think that our future is going to be just, just, you know, where we are today, but maybe with neon colored things and funny hats, that's not been the case ever, ever. The future is so much bigger than we can imagine. Why would it not be? Well, uh, you should definitely check out uh, Andrew's article in Reason. Uh, and if you're a patron, stick around for Good Day Internet, because we're going to talk about this a little more. But before we get to that, let's take a quick moment to check the mail. Bag. Let's do it. This one comes in from Damon, who wrote in about yesterday's show with you, Tom, and Chris Ashley. Damon said, you made some very good points and criticisms of Apple News. With so many news orgs relying on heavily Apple News, I have a few questions. How do organizations join? Has Apple ever denied an organization from joining? Has Apple ever dropped an organization that was originally part of Apple News? Uh, Damon says, I feel that how these questions are answered will help myself and others decide if this is a predominantly a net positive or negative. Could this be the early stages of Apple being a news gatekeeper, much like they are in their app store? Yeah, I, I think organizations joining is less controversial. Any organization that has a big enough audience to make it worthwhile can join if they agree to the terms on audience relations and revenue sharing. Uh, that That is easy. Has Apple ever dropped an organization? Uh, I've heard of organizations withdrawing, like the New York Times, but I've never heard of an organization being dropped by Apple. I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but I haven't heard of it. Uh, and that's where it would become concerning, is if Apple decided to drop or even just deprioritize the promotion of a news organization within Apple News because of its content. Uh, that's where it would start to get 
uh, concerning. I have not heard of anything like that happening. Uh, so far, Apple News has has played uh, pretty above board. If you're willing to agree to the revenue sharing uh, terms and, and the audience relation stuff, you're in. And a large number of reputable publishers have done so. So, the, you know, there's a few like the New York Times who don't find it to their taste, but it doesn't seem to be such an onerous set of terms that you don't have folks like the LA Times, Wall Street Journal, Scientific American, Wired, Billboard, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Apple is a weird company, though. I I don't know if you saw, they're doing a mini series about Huey P. Newton, which was a guy that was accused of killing a teenage girl and murdering all of the witnesses. And they're like, this sounds like a happy, feel good TV series. And so <laughs> yeah. I don't That's know the how their decision making process yeah. works. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, and then John Murray III uh, posted on our Patreon I want to be excited about the new co pilot machines coming out. I think I am more excited to see what companies and people do with them. I'd like to see more than just productivity. Thank you, John Murray III. Uh, if you want to talk to John about that, you can become a patron too, patreon.com slash DTNS. And thanks to everybody who writes in. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send your query or your thoughts in general. Andrew Main, uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today. Let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. Uh, AndrewMain.com. That is Andrew, M-A-Y-N-E.com. I have a blog there. And you can also follow me on Twitter or X. Whatever Indeed. Go find Andrew there. Uh, patrons, like I said, stick around for that extended show. Good day, Internet. We're going to keep talking about the effects we think AI will have on our world, not just in, in relation to, to Andrew's column, but but beyond that as well. Maybe take some questions from the chat if you've got some questions and you're watching or listening live. Stick around for that. You can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow, talking about how PCs, not necessarily game consoles, might be the future of video gaming. With Scott Johnson joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>